I wanted to get involved in the war. I wanted to get into action, because that's where people really needed chaplains. People that were dying and that were uh, in actual combat zones and so forth. Let's see. Daniel Ellsberg, Phil Caputo, Roger Baldwin, the old-time Union founder, Derek Walcott, ah, there, George Zabelka, Father George Zabelka. He's what it's all about. I call him smasher of myths. George is a storyteller, but the story he's telling happens to be scripturally true. That's the thing. It's scripture today that he's telling, and that's a story about neighbors and the world and peace. I went through parachute training. I didn't have to go as a chaplain, but I said, here I am with the men. I should do what they're doing and go through what they're going through. I've known him way back when he was in the military and he was a hawk. We used to call him General George as a nickname behind his back. But he's a different person altogether, different personality. Uh, rather than being the great disciplinarian, he's easy to get along with now. And that peace-loving George is going to Amarillo in a couple of days. Many years ago, as a U.S. Army chaplain, I watched on August 6th when the Enola Gate took off for Hiroshima, on August 9th when the boxcar took off for Nagasaki, and I said nothing. I knew hundreds of thousands, women and children, were vaporized, incinerated, and I said nothing. I was silent. Today, we have megatonnies that dwarf the imagination just waiting for that fatal command, accident or computer failure. We, all of us, must no longer be silent. Thank you. I was given an envelope opening that envelope, I found that we were supposed to fly back across the area that had been bombed and we were to, to come down, you know, on the deck. And when I say on the deck, I mean on the deck because we dropped to about 200 to 300 feet. And that's when I got the first experience, I guess, of the desolation that we'd created over an area that was much larger than I thought was possible with any bombing mission. At zero, ground zero, there was nothing but pulverization. One of my friends who was just standing beside me said, well, something is falling down from the, uh, from the airplane. It's a kind of parachute. And I saw it. And the instant I saw it, a heat, you know, lay, a flash. Yes. 
and I went outside of the factory, and it was completely a scene of Holocaust, a hell. And I saw among the charred bodies, I saw a mother with a baby. I thought that and I really felt sorry for the baby, so I tried to pat the baby's head, and then the head instantly uh, fell on the ground like ashes. As you moved out, we come across this one church steeple that was still standing, and then across buildings and people that were just screaming in the streets. Uh, a mass of humanity really destroyed. It's hard to to live with that kind of a memory. Sometimes I can't pass it. All right, the past is good to remember. And I went to Japan last year, and I went on a pilgrimage. It was a pilgrimage. It was a holy, uh, a walking, holy, every step of prayer, and asked forgiveness of the hibakshas and the deceased. I knelt down before the monument in the peace park last year and offered flowers and fell down on my face and I told the press and everybody I said I'm, I'm, I want to be forgiven for this crime. This year I was invited to come to Pantex, the place where these bombs are put together by the thousands. We are preparing uh, uh, another Calvary right here in, in, in Amarillo. People came to me and asked for recommendations. They were seeking employment there, and I gladly gave that to them. So for from 1948 until about 1980, I was rather blissfully unaware of the existence of Pantex and what they did there. That plant is the final assembly point for all nuclear weapons produced in the United States, something that I did not know then. There's an estimated five to eight nuclear bombs come off the assembly lines every day. This community here are blocking the track of the white train, the train that carries 180 hydrogen bombs every three months, either to the Trident submarine base where I live or to the Charleston Naval Weapons Station, the other end of the line. And the bombs delivered by this train, six times the power of the Second World War in each train. come then to offer thanks to God for all the gifts that he has given to us. At the same time, we ask his forgiveness for our failures to use those gifts wisely. The sins of violence of all the past years, but especially on this anniversary of the dropping of the first atomic bombs, we ask forgiveness for that sin. Let us bow our heads and ask the Lord to forgive us, to be with us, and to continue to bless us. God, we have betrayed you. We have heard the stories of the victims of nuclear weapons, those in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but we have been numbed by the horror of their pain. the weapons by name, but we have too often kept silent. 
We claim to put our trust in you, but our churches still look to the military for strength and protection. We have prayed for peace, but our tax money has paid for war. A sin left unnamed will be repeated in the future. That is why it is worth our while to go through the pain of remembering Hiroshima. The means that both sides used, deliberate attacks on civilian population centers, as in the case of London, Coventry, Hanover, Dresden, Osaka, Tokyo, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, could in no way be morally justified. Field is the biggest airfield in the world at that time. Four big runways capable of taking a plane every minute. And we knew they were carrying napalm. We knew they were bombing cities, destroying many civilians. And I knew that because I talked to the crew people bombing Japan. missions that finally the B-29s were called to make over the cities because of the more accurate bombing. And as he was flying over the city and down one of the main streets dropping napalm, uh, he saw this little boy uh, standing in front of him within, you know, just it was 100 feet below him or so. And he saw uh, the look of wonder and looking up at the plane as little boys do when they see big planes. And, and he knew that uh, within seconds this boy would be completely annihilated. He was dropping napalm, he would be burnt to death. We knew what was going on. And then another group came to the island, a very special group, uh, the 509th Composite Group. And we all on the island knew it was a special group. They were fenced in, they didn't have to go out for anything. And they asked me to have mass for the Catholic members there on Sundays and some of the weekdays and the services of a Catholic chaplain. Most people just knew that they had a special bomb. We called it the gimmick bomb. There was other names for it, but the gimmick bomb. Shortly afterwards, before the ship came back, it was radioed back. That caused a great stir on the island, of course, the first atomic bomb and the terrible effects of the bomb. This was something that uh, we talked about, and it was just the big news of the day. And here, possibly, this would be the end of the war. This would win the war for us. A group of us decided we ought to make ourselves known, and we tried to contact the, get to the uh, wing commander, at least, and uh, uh, let it be known that we thought we should, you know, hold off and see what goes rather than doing another atomic. It didn't happen that way. If I learned anything from that experience, I think it's the sacredness of each and every human being. God's love is for all of us, not just us in capitalist country, but so-called communist country too. Those beautiful children in Moscow are just as loved 
as the beautiful children in London or Toronto. In 1982 and 83, as has been said, I walked with an ecumenical group of 20 men and women in a pilgrimage to Bethlehem, Israel, a distance of some 6,500 miles. For two years, across America and Europe, we walked, prayed, and talked to all who would listen. We urged a new way of thinking if we were to survive. Martin Luther King, Jr. put it best. It is not a choice of violence or non-violence. It is a choice of non-violence or non-existence. Father Zaboka is very different from others. He is saying openly and publicly that he was wrong. And he has the courage to say so. And that's an inspiration to us. Without repenting of our past wrongdoing, how can we have the spirit of love, spirit of reconciliation, and to try to rebuild the world we envisage? Father George Zabilka stands at the low point when that form of Christianity which, which justifies mass violence and slaughter reaches its knotted at Hiroshima and at Nagasaki with Christians evaporating Christians by the tens of thousands in nine seconds. He's there. He is the channel that communicates the justification for that. No, I did not protest. My response was the same as to the, the firebombing of, that was going on over Tokyo and other cities. Uh, uh, war is hell. It's terrible. It's uh, horrible. But it's necessary in order to uh, bring uh, peace and bring victory. I'm quite sure that uh, uh, almost any chaplain that would have been involved in the uh, nuclear bombings of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki would have felt that was completely outside of their uh, sphere of competence, even past judgment on it. And then, of course, they would, uh, given the nature of the war, given the time of the war, given the prospects of uh, the continuation of the war, I'm quite sure most of them would have felt uh, elated at the thought that this has been done. The thought of civilians being obliterated by bombing just didn't seem to enter our mind. Uh, I, I think we were brainwashed uh, by our uh, uh, government, by the church from childhood. We were brought up to kind of follow the, the customs. Zabelka's position is entirely normal. 
it would be quite abnormal if he had uh, taken some other position. In my research, for example, into I think approximately 100 RAF chaplains who served during the Second World War, uh, I discovered that universally they see themselves as pastors, taking care of the individual souls and temptations of the men assigned to them. When it gets to matters of policy or strategy or something like that, they feel that's outside their scope, that they uh, uh, might personally be critical about it, but uh, they feel under no circumstance can they uh, speak out. And there was no protest by the church. The bishops weren't making any, uh, giving out any statements. Oh, I know they're probably, they can dig up some statements now saying that they were against civilian bombing, but at that time there was certainly nothing that we knew about. Uh, you know, this is the terrible thing about the just war teachings, that ever since they've been in use, uh, they've justified every side of every war that came along, so that uh, the German bishops, for example, were issuing statements calling upon German Catholics to fight for folk and fatherland as a Christian duty. Now, the American uh, bishops, for the most part, uh, didn't quite go that far, but there was no question as to uh, uh, where their loyalty was. We're the conquerors. We, we were able to do almost anything. There's a ferry that goes from Honshu to Hokkaido to the town of Sapporo. And uh, I remember driving up there. We didn't know exactly when the ferry would be going. And so we drove up to the dock where the ferry was uh, 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 it takes on its passengers and its cars. And we noticed that it was 100, 200 yards out already, going toward Hokkaido. And so with, the, with that pride and that feeling of power that, uh, you know, the conqueror has, we, we just drove on the dock, and then we got out and we waved to the ferry to come back. And sure enough, it stopped and came back, and we got on. This power of the victorious state. Although we did not treat the Japanese coolly, we helped in every way we could to feed and to give candy bars to people in need. In fact, a little boy wandered into our camp. He was hungry and uh, had lost his parents in the bombing, and so I brought him in and kind of adopted him. Made a little GI uniform for him, and he would sleep in my tent, and uh, he would take care of my dog. And we were very friendly, and uh, and I. I had to leave him when I left Japan, so I often wondered just what happened to him. Three of us chaplains took a trip to Nagasaki to see the bombing. There was no restrictions of any kind, so we went to the nearest places where there were still the survivors. And this, I think, is what really got me started on the on a even beginning of a new way of thinking on this, because here were little children that were uh, horribly burned and uh, suffering and, and dying. Uh, and uh, there, by that time, there were nurses and doctors that were taking care of them because this was two or three months afterwards. But this was the beginning of a whole new uh, kind of a worm squirming in my stomach that uh, something, something was wrong. These little children had nothing to do with the war. Why were they suffering?
when he was a pastor and he had the authority, he used every bit of it. I mean, there was no way that anyone was going to say, have the last word except George. And I remember going into the rectory one day when a student had been disrupting the class and the teacher had sent him to the rectory and George had him by a shirt collar pinned against the wall, telling him how very firmly the discipline would be instruct taken into the classroom and would have to be managed. And the, the student <laughs> was uh, just taken back and just standing there with a the guess, hardly breathing, you know. And I looked in and saw this and I thought, I had better come back another day for the question I wanted answered before I got the same uh, reflection or reaction. And many of the prisoners felt the same way. They, they hesitated. They thought he was an ice man, the ice man they used to call him. He was unapproachable. It seemed there were certain things kind of leading me into this area of social concern and social justice. And uh, I think this finally culminated when I was assigned to Sacred Heart Church in Flint, which was an inner city parish. It was right uh, next to the big Buick factory. And, and uh, of course, the civil rights movement was starting at that time. Martin Luther King, Jr and the whole nonviolent movement. This was my second big step. They want to throw white children and colored children into the melting pot of integration, through out of which will come a conglomerated, bladder, mongrel class of people. All races will be destroyed in such a movement. I, for one, under God, will die before I yield one inch to that kind of a movement. In 1948, I was pastor of a little mixed-colored church in Southern Maryland where the custom was that the whites receive communion before the blacks, and the blacks sit on a separate, uh, across the aisle, from the whites. Now, that was the, uh, the way I started, right out of the seminary into pastoral life. It was the sinful program, harming the white man's soul and the black man's body. And I saw the church going along with it, to say the least, in some places, even promoting it. So even a priest like myself, who knew nothing at all about racism, never had experienced it, faced with that situation, uh, I began to think. I was uh, forced to think about it. And so uh, the problem was put before people like George Zabelka in Flint, where the blacks were coming in, escaping from the institutional racism of the South, escaping from places like I was. And yet, they would meet racism there, too. I have to tell you a bit about Flint, Michigan. Flint is a, was a, is a central city in the history of the Great American Depression. Flint is a key city in the organization of the United Auto Workers of America back in the 30s. Flint is where the very famous sit-down strike occurred, where the workers sat in for 40 days and 40 nights. And that was a key moment in the formation of the United Auto Workers. And that's the city where George was. And that's the city of great unemployment and great despair. And also a blue-collar kind of patriotism, too, 
a Rambo-esque kind of stuff. George was a very dedicated person. He was one that knew the uh, members of, that was close to Sacred Heart. He knew the residents. He knew them by name. And he was the kind of person that uh, wasn't uh, put on. It was for real. He was a real civil rights man, one that was the same every day. For example, when we heard about the disturbance in Detroit, George was the only white that was able to walk the streets alone to keep the unrest down here. And to this day, when you think of civil rights in Genesee County, you think of Father George as being a person that can walk the street. Martin Luther King brought me into the notion of nonviolence for the first time. For that, the violent way was the only way. The connection he made, so pertinent to me as a priest, was love your enemies, do good to those that hate you, and so forth. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or for the extension of justice? When you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty, in the midst of an affluent society, and you suddenly find your tongue... He marched in Alabama on the civil rights issue, walked with Martin Luther King. He went to Resurrection City in Washington. He went to Salem. <laughs> an overall parallel, comprehensive and down to the last detail between militarism and racism. They, they both are blood brothers to each other. It's the same theology of racism that some people are inferior to others and be, can be killed. Some are not as valuable as others. The enemy, they can be killed to save our people. It's the same theology that says that we're not all children of God. Some are more valuable than others. It's the same people that opposed racism and slavery and, and the militarism, like Martin Luther King. We will match your capacity to inflict suffering. With our capacity to endure suffering, we will meet your physical force with soul force. We will not hate you, and yet we cannot in our good conscience obey your evil laws. Father Charlie McCarthy was an important change in his life. George had been listening to Martin Luther King. He had been reading into the civil rights issues. He had been looking at peace and justice. But now Charlie left with him with something to really dig down into his soul about. Why continue this fast year after year when so little seems to be happening? When Christians the world round are slaughtering each other as they have for the last 1,700 years. There is only one answer, and that is one in one equals two. The truth is the truth is the truth. Jesus Christ taught a teaching of nonviolent love. As the leading biblical scholar in the Catholic Church, probably in the 20th century, Father John L. McKenzie has said, if we cannot know from the New Testament that Jesus absolutely rejected violence, we can know nothing of his teaching or message. It is the clearest of teachings. It was 
strictly by accident. He was brought in in our diocese to give a workshop, a three-day workshop on pacifism, on the theology of Christian nonviolence. And I was searching at that time uh, in all different ways, and of course this caught my eye, nonviolence, and Martin Luther King Jr. and so forth. So I came to his workshop. I remember in the middle of that retreat, at one of the breaks at lunch, uh, I remember him saying that, uh, I hear what you're saying and I've listened to it almost three times now. But I'll tell you, I've been through seminary and I've read Catholic books and papers and I've never heard any of this. Now, how could I have been a priest for all these years, been through all this training, and not heard, heard any of this? And uh, I, I don't know. But... All of that Charlie told me was uh, certainly way back that we had studied, but it was not accented. Uh, it, was, uh, it was kind of submerged. We have a problem in Christianity in the sense that History is not just something that occurs in the past. History is what is remembered of the past. And that critical line from Orwell's 1984, he who controls the present controls the past, and he who controls the past controls the future. Because people tend to act in the present and in the future, depending upon how they perceive the past has been. The oldest spiritual tradition in the Christian church is the tradition of nonviolence. It dates from Jesus and goes right from the first martyr Stephen on through the, the conversion from the violent Saul to the nonviolent Paul. Right on through three centuries, the first three centuries, the centuries closest to Jesus, what we have is a church that is nonviolent. That is, it's not that Christians didn't commit violence. It's that it wasn't approved. As they committed adultery, but it wasn't approved. And there's a world of difference between sin and saying, I'm sorry, getting up and starting over again, and doing evil and calling evil good. And for three centuries, it was absolutely clear that conformity with the mind of Christ, conformity with the heart of Christ, was utterly inconsistent with homicide. The pivotal point, the axial point, is the Emperor Constantine. In, four, in, in, in 311, you could not be a member of the fighting Roman army and be a Christian. By 416, you could not be a member of the fighting Roman army unless you were a Christian. When this entered into my soul, I realized I had to accept everything Jesus tells us as difficult as impractical, as far out as it would seem, uh, or else just give it up. Not just my priesthood, but give up the whole Christian uh, bit, uh, all of Christianity. And, and uh, actually, as I've mentioned, I had a friend of mine that actually did that, and we used to discuss this together. I respect them and their consciences. I was part. I wore the uniform. The beautiful ideals of the military, of love for one another, a squad of eight or twelve men in the military in Vietnam or whatever war, bound together. They give their lives for one another. Beautiful. And patriotism, the love of country, love of their families. They, they appreciate this. That's why I went in there. But what is a soldier, a paid professional killer? Can't get away from it. We have a bayonet practice, uh, and people are thrusting bayonets into the bags and, you know, yelling and screaming. And, and of course, the reason they're doing that is the, to, to give them the courage and give them the strength and the, the viciousness to be able to do this to a human being. And they see a chaplain there. The chaplain sort of authorizes it. This is all right. This is okay. Uh, the same way with rifle shooting and practice uh, in shooting. Now here they are all the, uh, lined up and they're shooting at these targets that are somewhat formed like a human being. So they say, fine, especially <laughs> my own, myself. I used to shoot with them. I used to like to shoot. And um, 
Uh, I know I was even part of a rifle team uh, in the National Guard, and we won some uh, prizes as being first in, in accuracy. But this is the awful part of it, is that you, you think only of the technical elements, how accurate you were, but you don't think of the reason behind it, which is to prepare you to kill human beings. I do remember the speech about if we had joined the Marine Corps to learn a trade, we were in the wrong place. We were there to learn how to kill. If we wanted to learn how to type or how to run computers, we should have joined the Navy. So, I mean, it's, uh, I think it was implicitly in what, what we were being trained to do. There's no other purpose. I mean, uh, I used to wonder when we were sitting there on the, in the compound in front of our billets, shining shoes and polishing brass. What's the purpose of cleaning a rifle if not to make the thing work better so you can shoot somebody with it? There really is method in the madness. It's quite, a, quite an awakening shock uh, to step off the bus and find out uh, in one moment it was different. Get up there on the sidewalk facing that way, right there on the curb, Mo. Who are you, private? I don't have all day. I said get on the curb, facing the group. Curb, facing me. Do not run. Walk swiftly. Do not run. Walk swiftly. Ah, Go ahead now, straight to the front. It was a process of, of changing each of us from individuals, uh, our own thoughts, our own feelings, our, uh, our moral life changed. Uh, so that they got you to the point to where you couldn't think on your own. Many of us became just sort of uh, blobs. to be rather specialized groups. They tend to group together because uh, they all have something in common. They are all white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, or they are all upper class, or they all play golf, or, or uh, they uh, are all Italians, or they all like auto racing. And so birds of a feather tend to flock together. And, and so it's, uh, uh, there's a tendency for most groups to become specialized. But this specialized nature of groups tends to lead to their immaturity. They always think that they are better than other groups. They always form their identity against other groups. In fact, uh, one of the things that's very common in, in uh, group formation is something that we call enemy formation, where uh, if, a, uh, if a group, if the uh, esprit de corps, which is a military term, the spirit of the group uh, is lacking, one of the best ways to revive it or raise it is to, is to find an enemy. Uh, to focus upon to then uh, uh, lead to group cohesiveness. And this is a typically uh, well-known kind of pattern in the military. But once again, it's not something that occurs just in the military. It occurs in other institutions as well. Now, well, first off, what is a mine? A mine is nothing more, Privates, than an explosive or chemical substance that is designed or made to destroy and kill the enemy. You want him, you want to rip out his eyeballs again, you want to tear apart his love machine, you want to destroy him, Privates. You don't want to have nothing left of him. You want to send him home in a glad bag to his mommy. <laughs> hey, show no mercy for the enemy. They are not going to show it on you. We run PT in the morning, and uh, every time your left foot hit the hit the deck, you had a chance to kill, 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 kill. It was drilled in your mind so much that it seemed like when it actually came down to it, that didn't bother you. What I missed in the most of my uh, years as a chaplain was the realization that uh, this is not an ordinary parish. Help! 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 Help!
behind you. You got a whole line behind you. Get up there. Hey, Come here. Violence was a part of it. It didn't take too many whacks, you know, alongside the head with that stick before you realize that the violence of it is part and parcel of what you would be trying to do. It's either you or the other guy. It doesn't take long to decide that if it's if I'm the one who stands a chance of getting killed, then um, I will use what I've been taught with a bayonet, uh, hand to hand, the rifle, whatever else we were trained in. It became very easy to shoot at whatever moved. The real easy part of it became when, when you begin to see other people as non-human beings. I wish that I had tapes of those morale guidance programs that we used to give to the men. The purpose was morale, to bring the soldiers up to a high morale so that they would follow orders, blindly if necessary, to do what has been commanded. In the uh, manual of land warfare, uh, there are the words saying that they are not supposed to obey an illegal order. Uh, in fact, the matter, what they are really taught and what is really drummed into them is that they're supposed to obey all orders and that they get in serious trouble if they don't obey orders. They're supposed to learn how to obey orders instinctively. This is uh, part of their training. And it is just well known in the military that a, that a soldier, particularly at a lower level, a grunt, is not supposed to think. You're just supposed to follow. And uh, in this way, people, when they give up their capacity to think, of course, they also give up their, their conscience uh, or their ability to think about it, uh, the larger picture in any ways. Just, just what they're focused on, uh, uh, what they've been ordered to do is their only concern. You live under two completely different sets of morals. You couldn't, yes, you couldn't survive in a combat situation with the same set of morals you have in everyday life. You, no. You'd never make it to the first week. The motivation it takes to actually look down the sights of your rifle and pull the trigger and kill the guy, that's the motivation it takes. That's what you get paid to do. It's like being a bag boy at a supermarket, you know. If that's what you get paid to do is bag groceries, you bag groceries. If you get paid to look down your sights and pull the trigger and kill a man, that's what you do. Even today, I'm still, in, in many ways, fighting the Vietnam War. When I got back, I spent 10 or 11 years by myself on a farm. Violent things that were in me that I had to deal with, at least to the point where I could control it in public. I've often thought it was a blessing from God himself that I never met a woman that I would think about marrying. It would have been a hideous life for somebody else to have put up with. Church and the government of the United States, whether that's the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, are on different paths now. We're beginning to part company. We're going away from the old um, system that we had where you had the papal flag and the American flag in the sanctuary of our churches. And, and this is causing a problem not only for the government but for our own people. Because we were a minority church and, and when we first came here, and we had to establish our patriotism, and we did it by being right up front. And as a result of that, uh, many of the military are Roman Catholic, as high as 50%. And you can understand that the government might now be concerned that we are forming consciences among our people and saying we cannot use nuclear weapons. I had... 20-some years of Catholic education in Catholic institutions uh, without having been formally taught 
that there was a theological tradition within the church, and in fact the original tradition within the church, that called for disciples of Jesus to follow a way of nonviolence. I had never been taught that. I just didn't come into the program of teaching anywhere in, in that whole period of time. The issue for the church today is not nuclear war but the total and unequivocal rejection in theory and in practice of all war and all mass slaughter. There is nothing in the life or teaching of Jesus that would suggest that while it is illegitimate to incinerate people by nuclear warhead, it is legitimate to incinerate people by napalm or flamethrower. Condemning nuclear war exclusively, a Christian can thereby give implied moral approval to other forms of mass slaughter. What level of slaughter is acceptable? It's a vow of the survivors that we'll do everything we can to make sure no human being go through the experience we had. What now has become the Peace Corps was spawned in those meetings on Tinian after the atomic bomb. The Peace Academy would be the sixth arm of the Pentagon. An academy to build up a clientele of modern thinkers. Before his death, Gandhi made the point that it's only Christians who do not see Jesus as nonviolent. Jesus taught is nonviolent, active resistance to evil. We're giving everything we have. It's not a passive thing. It's an active resistance, even to the point of giving our lives. 